Live from the YouTuber machine, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and don't you hate it when it feels like there's all these people watching you work? What? I'm on camera. There's no... I don't think so. Little white. There's no little white. Oh, little white. Whoa! Uh, uh, one second. Okay. Uh, so, um... Hey, hello world. Now, millions of fans can see who's really the key to this show. That is me. Oh, hell, they'll never know the difference. On today's special stack event, we welcome from Dimensional Funds, Dr. Apollo Lupescu. He'll break down your investing questions and show you how to tweak your diversification for better returns and maybe even a smoother ride. Got questions of your own? If you're here with us live, use those little instruments on the end of your hands and type a question to us in the chat window. Speaking of questions, it wouldn't be a great live event without one of my trivia questions. And then we'll all see if we can make OG sweat with your questions on everything else in your financial or personal lives. Credit, insurance, budget, Marital issues? He can cover most of those, I promise. And now, two guys who have insisted that investing 100% in baseball cards is the way to go. It's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. Oh, man. I'm glad you could make this one, Doug. If you guys remember last time, Doug had... Uh... Doug checked out his internet checked out the second we began and yeah. you've made it so far. It wasn't the internet show. It was all of the power for the entire neighborhood. Like the second that I was supposed to go live. And you know what happened? It was because you pulled up David Hasselhoff. It'll <laughs> probably, I thought my family was punking me. That's funny. Hey everybody. Welcome to the stack. We're so glad you're here with us. We started these last year because of the pandemic and had so much fun doing it. And, uh, this time I think is our best ever OG. Am I allowed to unmute myself now? You, you can unmute yourself. Absolutely. Okay. For the time being, you know, okay. Thank you. How are you, man? I'm doing good. It's, uh, you know, Wednesday. So trying to, uh, Keep it together for a few more, a few more minutes. Just, just another like 55 minutes to go. Uh, uh, we've got a fantastic show for you today. We've got Dr. Apollo Lupescu here, who is going to do some magic on your portfolio. And I know, OG, you and I are getting questions all the time. People are really worried about their portfolios. They're worried about their money. And how do we, you know, with all the things that you hear on the news yeah. every day, how do we get through it? Yeah. Inflation. Is that something we have to worry about? Is the stock market overvalued? Is that something oh, I have to move over now? Oh, hold on. There we go. Got Doug out of there finally and I can scoot over. Uh, you know, all those different things that we have to, uh, do we have to worry about any of it? Uh, so I'm excited to have Apollo here. He is awesome. Yeah, let's get right to it and introduce our guest. Our guest today is Vice President Dimensional Fund Advisors, one of the Investment manager in the world, OG managing this number. Ready? Six hundred billion dollars in assets. It's a, it's a nice start, but I don't think you can. I don't think you could live on it. Apollo, by the way, at Dimensionals, considered the secretary of explaining stuff for Dimensional, which is exactly what we need tonight. He's been with Dimensional in Santa Monica for seventeen years after teaching at the University of California. By the way, teaching at the University of California not that important. Receiving his PhD in economics and finance from UC Santa Barbara, Try that's also that. not important. You know the there important part. The important part is, and I know why you moved over, is because he's a Spartan. <laughs> he has a degree from economics from Michigan State University, and Dr. Apollo Lupescu is here with us. How are you, man? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I did see that uh, Michigan license plate there, so. <laughs> I know. I'm glad you good. You, know, you notice how on screen, Dr. Lupescu, we have him surrounded. That's our goal. Yeah. I know. <laughs> It's yeah. fine. You know, as, as, as long as, uh, as, as I have friends that it doesn't matter, it's Michigan, Michigan state, when we're in state, it's a little different, but 
you know, haven't been out of state for a while. I actually do miss Ann Arbor. I do miss Michigan. So anybody from Michigan is, is a friend of mine. Not not that people from other states are not, but literally Michigan. <laughs> except, like those, except those scoundrels from Pennsylvania. Or maybe Ohio State. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hey, uh, send your hate, to, send your hate to these two guys, not me. Uh, uh, we've got some fantastic questions for you the, guys in the chat. If you're here with us live, please, we've got Dr. Lepescu here specifically for you, but I think, uh, I will kick it off with some of the stuff that we're not supposed to worry about, right? The stuff, the stuff that we think about all the time, but we keep telling all of our stacker friends that you shouldn't. Let's start off with the big I word that we keep hearing over and over, inflation. What's your thought on inflation right now? Yeah, it is. It is a big topic. You cannot turn on the, the, the you know, any any media or read something without running into this inflation. And, and, and my thought is that that as I as my wife is talking to me about this and friends are, are asking me, it seems that the inflation is, is put out there almost uh, in a way to scare people, that it's something really scary that you should be afraid of. Uh, and it's like the boogeyman. And to some degree, there's no doubt that inflation we know uh, basically means that prices go up from year to year, uh, which means that the same dollar amount that you have will not be uh, enough to buy the same things year from year, year from year uh, from one year to another. So this idea of inflation is that that prices go up from one year to another, uh, and and that is concerning, particularly on folks who are on a fixed budget or they're uh, on a on a pension or they uh, they don't get to adjust uh, whatever assets they have. That that's really terrifying to to lose that purchasing power. Uh, but one thing I want to start with is that that inflation uh, by itself, that the, the idea of moving prices up, it's nothing new. It's been with us forever. And in fact, the average annual increase over the long run in the U.S. has been about 3%. So, you know, if you folks in the audience bought some speakers for your computer and last year there were $100, based on the historical uh, 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 average, your speakers this year would cost roughly $103. And that's something that is, it's not unusual, it's not unprecedented. And I would say a lot of economists say that it's desirable. We want prices to go up a little bit uh, because a lot of these companies and a lot of farmers are borrowing money and they have to pay interest uh, and they have to generate more revenue. Uh, so one way is to sell more products. The other one is to have the prices go up. And in fact, we know that during the Great Depression, prices went the other way and they dropped. And that was terrifying because a lot of farmers uh, could not pay back the loans and they went under. They had to produce more just to generate the same revenue and they went under. Uh, so prices going up, again, it's not unusual, uh, not unprecedented. And in fact, to some degree, it's desirable. Even the Federal Reserve, uh, guys, have has put a target of about 2%. Uh, on the inflation rate. So two to three percent range is something that that to begin with, just to set the, the, the stage, it is not something that that any of us should be really afraid of, but rather, uh, you know, just just consider as part of the norm as part of the historical norm. So some of these numbers that we saw, the eye-popping numbers of May or June, a lot of people called those, uh, what, transitory was the word I think that officials kept using, that this was just a blip because of things catching back up, like airlines catching back up, cars catching back up. Do you buy, you buy that then, it sounds like? Well, I, I think that inflation um, has two fundamental sources. And, and the first one is that you have the economics of supply and demand. And maybe we'll touch on this for a minute because it's really important. So part of the reason that prices change is because of dynamics in the economy, the supply and demand. And it's important to touch on this. And there's a second aspect of it, which is uh, human emotions and human behavior uh, and, 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 uh, and their perceptions uh, that can also carry inflation independent of these current dynamics of supply and demand. So let's maybe look at the first one, which is supply and demand. And why is it that, uh, that that's so important to understand? Uh, you know, and by the way, a lot of this inflation talk, uh, I'm not sure about you guys, but I, I, I heard a lot of inflation at the time when the federal uh, government started putting in place the stimulus. And the idea was that you have a flood of new dollars in the economy. Well, surely that's going to make the prices go up uh, and, and that's, uh, that's going to lead to inflation. Uh, and, and certainly that's, that's something that, that, that uh, so many folks are considering. Is it possible that this, all this uh, stimulus money will lead to inflation? Uh, but let's come back to this, to this supply and demand. If you think about uh, uh, any product that we make, so let's just say pens. I, I manufacture pens. Just to make it easy as an example, I'm a pen manufacturer, not a chewed up one, but a normal one. <laughs> uh, and I make these pens and I have some orders. They're coming in. I fill the orders. Uh, I ship them out. Uh, and, uh, and at that point, everything's good. I make some money and customers are happy. 
Now, perhaps because there's an influx of dollars, now I get more orders. And here's the thing. If my factories, if the economy as a whole has the capacity to produce the additional pens, well, you have the assembly line. You can hire the people at the right, uh, the same wage. You can buy the materials. All you do is you produce those pens, you ship them out, you make more money, uh, but you don't have to raise prices. In other words, I think a lot of what you see right now is not necessarily uh, driven by the demand side, uh, but also what we have to consider is the supply side, the ability uh, that that economy has to produce. And what's fascinating is that if you go back to the uh, financial crisis, there was a program put in place called quantitative easing. Remember that? <laughs> it yes. had three versions, yeah, yeah. three one. And over the course of five years, I just looked it up on Wikipedia, over the past uh, uh, five years, or not past five years, from 2009 roughly to 2014, that program deployed four and a half trillion dollars in the U.S. economy. And remember what we heard a lot back then? The same question, boy, this is going to lead to inflation. The dollar is going to lose its value. It's going to be horrific. And, and if you go back now, uh, since quantitative easing was put in place, any guesses what the inflation has been on an annualized basis since the time that quantitative easing was put in place? Oh, I can't, I can't imagine. Yeah. Let's say it's, it's three pretty and low. a half. Yeah. Two, it's, it's two. actually about between one and a half and 2%. Wow. Okay. So even with all, all that money, somehow the prices didn't go up. And in fact, we didn't even reach the desired target that the Fed had put in place. Forget about the long-term average. So how is it possible? And the answer is because there's a second piece to this puzzle, which is the ability that the economy has to produce. And a lot of economists were surprised by, by the, 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 uh, the capacity that, that the economy had. Uh, so even as these orders came in, the, 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 there was enough capacity to produce. Uh, so th this is overly simplified, but it gives you this idea that when you think about inflation, it, you, know, you can look at, absolutely it matters to look at the, the, uh, the, the money and how much consumers have and businesses and the government spending, but it's also hugely important to look at the supply side. And what he mentioned is that, that absolutely right. I think a few weeks ago, there was a report saying that prices from last year have uh, moved up five and a half percent or 5.4 percent, yeah, which is well, a lot higher than, than we've been. As I said, we've been around one and a half percent over the past uh, uh, 10 years or so. Uh, but, you know, take a deeper look. And the first thing you notice is that, listen, prices last year were drastically low. We're in lockdown. Nobody was buying anything. It was just a very terrible time for the economy. So the fact that they're higher right now shouldn't be terribly surprising. But again, take a deeper look. And what you see is that from uh, reports, about a third, actually a third of the price increase was due to used car price increases, mm -hmm. a third. And then you had airlines and food. And think about this. This third increase in 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 in, in used car prices is it the demand side that people are buying like crazy? Not necessarily. It seems like there's a shortage of chips, uh, and and there are no new cars being produced at the same pace that that the consumers want them. Uh, you know, partly because the way that that uh, uh, some of these car manufacturers decided last year that that the demand might drop and they didn't order enough, whatever the reason might be, uh, it's a supply issue. And and the idea is that once the supply uh, you know gets 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 back on track things that prices uh, are supposed to drop. And, and by the way, that's exactly what we saw with lumber. I have some neighbors, you know, I, I yeah. love the pieces. They moved in and, and when they started the project a year ago, it took forever. I, I'm so glad they're done so we don't have to deal with hammering. But um, yeah. when they started, uh, they, they were telling me not too long ago that, that over the course of the project, lumber tripled in price. The two by four, the piece of wood tripled in price. And, and when you look at it, a lot of mills, thought that with the economic downturn, there will be a drop in demand. And they shut down the mills. They sent everybody home. And then once they realized that, boy, people do home improvement and demand hasn't dropped, uh, they, you know, they, they realize they need to restart production. But it's not as immediate as it seems. Uh, so prices went up and up and up. But as these mills uh, uh, reopen, what you hear right now, what you read in the paper, is that the price of lumber had dropped by two thirds over the past few weeks. And it's again, it's a supply and demand issue. And, 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 and uh, a lot of what you hear right now is that there is a transitional, exactly what you said, is a transitional phase that we move from the pre pandemic, the pandemic world to, to whatever uh, after pandemic kind of resumed to normal. But is that let me a lot tell of you, movement? Do I, go ahead. 
Is that a lot of movement, the movement we've seen in the commodities market, by the way, what you said about lumber and it's the same, right? With toy, I mean, people, it seems like forever ago, but the toilet paper fiasco, we're seeing shipping of goods like from point A to point B, semiconductors. Is this, is this, is this commodities volatility that we've seen? Is that just the supply chain going like this? It certainly is part of it. I mean, and again, it, there, there are so many reports out there. Uh, you read about all these shipping uh, uh, problems because right here in Los Angeles, where I am, uh, there is a huge line of cargo ships waiting to be unloaded, but so many people were sick. Uh, so many dock workers were sick that they just couldn't physically unload the boat. So they're waiting a lot longer. So there are certainly a lot of issues that, that are still related to the pandemic. Um, but the big question is that is this something that that is uh, is this something that that is uh, uh, transitory, as you said, and, and, right. and once you get past this, we'll go back to the normal inflation or is this something more permanent? And the reality is that there are two different narratives and there, there are some proponents in each camp. And, and I cannot tell you that I'll take a side. I, I don't know if this is transitory. I don't know if this is long lasts a long time, but I would tell people there is a way in which we can get a sense of what might come down the road. And that is not in, in the form of an op-ed piece. It's not a post on a blog. It's not a talking head. It's, it's, not, it's actually a much more interesting and robust way to see what to expect over the next, let's say, five years. What happens today is that uh, there are different bonds, and bonds is a form of lending. So if a company or a corporation wants to borrow money, uh, they can take out a loan <laughs> in the form of a bond. It's, it's a form of lending, uh, and investors lend money to companies, uh, and there are some bonds that, that adjust for inflation and some that don't. And a metric that's been known for a long time looks at, at the difference uh, in some of these bonds uh, and, and how market participants uh, are investing uh, to figure out what is the expectation and the, uh, for inflation. And the reason I bring this up is because this is not um, any one person's opinion. This is not what one individual says or something. It's the combined wisdom of, of, of thousands of, of market participants, Stanford MBAs and Harvard PhDs, and they're all uh, voting in this. What I think of it as a referendum, and they're voting in this referendum every day with, with billions and billions of dollars. So it's, it's a referendum. It's a real referendum where people vote with actual dollars. Uh, and if you want to know what they expect, uh, that's the metric that, that I think it'd be useful for investors to, uh, to look at. And that is published uh, by the Federal Reserve. Uh, it's, it's a public site. I'm going to actually share with you the, uh, uh, the website right now. Uh, this is the, the live website where you see uh, the, uh, something called the break-even, the five-year break-even inflation rate. So what it means is it's spelled out right here on the page. It basically looks at what market participants expect inflation to be in the next five years on average. So these are the proponents of both uh, narratives, both that is transitory and not transitory, the optimist, the pessimist. Uh, so let's see what that tells us. So when you look over the past five years or so, uh, what you see is the inflation was below one and a half percent, then it was in the one and a half to two uh, percent. And then when the pandemic hit, it went the other way. The, the market expected prices not to grow, which is a problem by itself. But as the economy reopens, stimulus and so forth, where we are today, as of last night, uh, as of uh, uh, actually as of today, uh, because the market's uh, it's closed as of today, uh, uh, Ju July 28th, uh, what you see is that that the expectations that the market has, uh, all these market participants, the combined wisdom is that over the next five years, the inflation on average will be about 2.57%. Uh, which is, again, it's a little bit higher uh, than it's been over the past uh, uh, five years, uh, but it's in that zone of 2 to 3% uh, that is really in the past hasn't screamed panic. In fact, if you take this uh, time series as long as it goes, uh, what you see is that where we are today is, is pretty much in line with where we've been in the past, and, and perhaps the anomaly has been this period uh, with too low of an inflation. Uh, so, uh, so the, the idea is that that uh, that this uh, indicator, this signal that the market's sending, is that uh, inflation will be a little bit higher, but not tremendously higher. And in fact, if you look at the five to ten years, uh, what it seems to indicate is a return back towards two percent. 
Um, and uh, and what's interesting about this, and the reason I suggested folks to, to look at this on a more regular basis, is because this adjusts every single day. Uh, so every single day, uh, you see adjustments. So as information comes in about stimulus, about uh, infrastructure bill, about uh, the supply chain, all of these are incorporated on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so towards the beginning of the year, uh, we're about 2%. We went up to about 2.7 in, uh, in, in, in May, and where we are today is about 2.5. So again, I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, try to say that I have a crystal ball. I do have one, but it's a different one. Uh, but, but the reality is that, that that's what the signal that the market's sending. And this will change for sure. Uh, but within the signal, there are the optimists, the pessimists, the ones that think it's transitory and non-transitory. All of this is baked into this expectation. I love this idea of not basing it on your gut. Actually, there are even free websites out there like Fred, where you can look at people voting, to your point, voting with their money. We've got bunches of people with lots of interesting things. I think, I think uh, Dr. Lepescu, we're going to turn it over to our audience because Catherine, a good point. We were talking about inflation. You're talking about inflation going up and she's worried that companies not giving cost of living uh, raises every year. And, and that may leave people with, uh, with the deficit. And we're seeing a few people talking about that. Is this idea of people leaving their jobs, right? Saying, Hey, you're not going to give me a cost of living increase. I am going to, you, you hear these reports where I live in their jobs. Is that, does that offset what Catherine and others here are talking about? Actually, it ties almost perfectly into the second part of the uh, the the the, uh, the, uh, the fundamentals of, of inflation. So part of it is supply and demand, but the other part is exactly what uh, uh, Catherine has had, 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 had touched on, which is that that inflation also has a human component that involves emotions and expectations. And the reason I mention this is because uh, the last time that we saw big inflation. Uh, actually, the, in my, in not only my lifetime, but you go after World War II in our parents' lifetime, there've only been two periods uh, when when we saw high inflation, uh, and the first period of, of uh, uh, was in 1973-74. Remember those days? What happened back then was remarkable. We nope. had uh, the move from the gold standard to the type of money we have today, which is not backed by, by gold. Uh, and that was led by, we had uh, price and, uh, and wage freeze, so the prices couldn't move. And then when they did, boom, they popped. Uh, we had the oil embargo and uh, what happened with the, um, with the OPEC in the 70s. Uh, and we also had a food shortage. So it, we had this, uh, and what it led to was um, uh, people expecting inflation to continue. And one of the stories that's really interesting is that Paul Volcker, who was the Fed of the chairman at the time, uh, said that that he met with um, uh, he met with uh, business folks to talk about inflation and how you tame it. And a lot of these folks had the expectation that inflation will continue to go higher. And the way that he said, a CEO kind of flatly put out, listen, my union workers, I absolutely convinced that that inflation will be about 12 to 14% over the next five years. So in the contract right now, I have a 10% or 12% increase per year over the next five years. And if you have that expectation, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's one of the reasons that it got stuck in there is because everybody expected it. So the workers, to the point, I want some pay increase to overcome inflation. And if the union thinks that, if the if the bosses, they thought that themselves as CEOs, well, obviously, at that point, you're going to see a price increase almost because you have these contracts that have already negotiated, that been negotiated uh, that, that, that would make the prices go up. Now, is that the same case today? Uh, it doesn't seem so. In fact, there was an article just this weekend uh, where people were looking at the expectations and nobody really expected sky high inflation. They expected some. Uh, so, Catherine, the, the good news is that uh, at least based on what we know right now, uh, th th there will likely be some pay increases, uh, but not necessarily uh, because of the inflation. And nobody really expects at this moment that inflation is going to be what it was in the 70s. Um, but I think the pay increases that you might that you might have to keep up with inflation uh, might come from the fact that right now everybody's talking about this shortage of workers. And, and if you feel like I'm not getting the right wage, 
you can either go negotiate uh, or you can look somewhere else. And there was a, a great story that uh, a whole town that used to be, um, I, I forgot exactly the manufacturer, but but they they just didn't feel like they get paid enough. Uh, well, some other manufacturer uh, just lived, opened a factory not far from there and put billboards all over town. You know, you don't like those folks? Come work for us. <laughs> uh, so these days you can do that more easily to uh, keep up with inflation if you feel like your employer is not doing it. But I'm not here to give job advice, by the way. So <laughs> don't put <laughs> a good job. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but the point is the point being that that the reason you don't see these pay increases uh, at, at, a, at, a, at a great level is because the expectation that both the, the, the unions who negotiated on people's behalf and the CEOs, they're both kind of see that at least based on what we know now, it's going to be uh, something that it's a neighborhood of what we've seen uh, historically. There's a couple of very serious comments here about how OG is clearly winning the hair battle of the three of us. So oh, barely. Uh, Yes, thanks for those. Oh, also, barely. some comments here about stagflation as as part of this, where they keep prices the same but give you less stuff. Emblem says, my Chick-fil-A meal was a good 60 cents higher today from the last time I noticed, but I got a ketchup in my bag without even asking. I thought that was great. <laughs> Let's That's move. funny. Uh, somebody asked very seriously, though, about uh, tips. And 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 uh, let me put this on the screen. Phil says, tips seem confusing. Is there anything they can provide that an equity allocation won't? If I have early retirement considerations, qualified versus non-qualified. Let's talk for t about tips for a second, Dr. Lopescu. Yeah. So as an investor and, and all of you, everybody on this call, um, we have the ability to tap into the financial markets uh, in two fundamental ways. One of them is to uh, uh, buy ownership in companies. What the stock market allows us to do is basically have a stake in capitalism. It allows us to participate in the ownership of, the, of these companies. So I think it's an it's an amazing uh, it's a proposition that 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 we can all partake in, uh, and and that's what the stock market allows you to do. It's it's uh, uh, it democratized uh, 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 ownership of companies, and anybody can be part of it. Now we might not have the same fraction as the, the big guys, but we all can partake in the in the success of these companies. That's what the stock market allows you to do. You buy ownership, and ownership comes uh, with obviously uh, as a business owner, you have you are in entitled uh, to a fractional uh, a portion of the earnings and the, and the cash flows that the company generates to investors. Uh, so that's one thing. That's the stock market. So when you meant equity, uh, that to me is what equity is. Equity is a stock market and it has to do the ownership in companies uh, and, and, and being able to tap in the profits uh, proportional to your ownership. Tips, on the other hand, are in the category of bonds and lending. Uh, so bonds are different because you don't buy ownership in anything. You just simply lend your money. And the beauty of lending the money in a way is that, that there's a contract that specifies an interest rate for how long you get that interest rate. And at the back end, you get your money back. And that's the, for a lot of investors, this is appealing because it's spelled out in the contract. I know exactly what the interest rate that I'll get for how long. Uh, so I don't have the uncertainty of the stock market because if the company makes money, goes up in value. If it doesn't make money, it drops in value. So there's a lot of fluctuation where, with this, uh, yeah, you're a lot steadier. Uh, and and, and, and the, one of the things that's interesting with, with these bonds is that when you lend money, you can do it for 30 days, you can do it for a year, uh, or you can do it for 10 or 20 years. Uh, so it can be a very long-term proposition. And when you do it for 30 days, you know it doesn't matter much if inflation changes. I'm gonna get back my money in 30 days Typically, inflation doesn't change that much in 30 days. But if you lock up your money for 10 years and, you you know, let's say you get paid 2% on your money and all of a sudden inflation goes up to 4%, well, that interest payment doesn't even keep up with inflation. And that's not so good for you. Uh, and, and not long ago, uh, maybe, no, you know, uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago, something like that, um, there was this idea of what if we create a bond that adjusts with inflation? So if inflation is high, the value of the bond adjusts, so you actually get paid more. And what these tips mean, they're treasury inflation protected securities. And what it means is that, that the value of this, uh, of this bond adjusts with inflation. So if you have very high inflation, the value goes up. And given that you know the interest, uh, at that point, you, uh, you, you, uh, you get paid more. Uh, and, and it's been appealing for a lot of folks. Uh, so when you think about uh, when you think about tips, I would like you to consider them in the bucket of bonds. Uh, but stocks and bonds are incredibly different, and, and this is where before we get into your specific question on tips, 
Tips are just one form of a bond that would protect you uh, against the inflation uh, in a very specific way. But uh, bonds, to begin with, I have to say that bonds are very different than stocks. And maybe I'll illustrate this with some of the you know more interesting data that that, that you can find out there. Um, and uh, uh, and we have a great book called the Matrix Book that that's been uh, fantastic at, at looking at some of the the, the data. Uh, it's it's on my desk. I have it all the time. It's a big book of data, <laughs> big book of investment numbers. Um, and what's interesting is that that if you look at the stock market as a whole, uh, what you see is that over the long run, if we go back to you know 1920s, 30s, uh, you know a very long time, uh, on average the U.S. stock market has given investors an annualized return of about nine to ten percent per year. That's been the long term annualized average return in the S and P 500, which is a measure of the broad market. But because profits fluctuate, so does the value of these stocks. So it's been all over the place. Uh, and and I don't, I'm not aware that in any one year, uh, the market returned its actual average. Uh, but it has been a very rewarding ride for investors. Turns out that my dad is born in 1926. And if my grandparents, <laughs> his parents had put one single dollar, one single dollar at the time that my dad is, was born, that one dollar uh, from that time would have grown to more than $10,000 roughly speaking, uh, in the S&P 500. So a fantastic growth of, of, of money. One dollar in my dad's lifetime, uh, by the time he turned 94, he'll be 95 soon enough, uh, he, he turned it into 10,000. But that's the stock market. If you invested in bonds, and let's look at the 30-day U.S. government bonds called the 30-day treasury bills, over the same time period, what you see is that, that, um, that uh, uh, these, uh, these treasury bills have not returned as much. The return has been about three to 4% per year on average. So a little bit about inflation, the long-term inflation. But the great news is that over the past 90 plus years, there has never been a single negative calendar year uh, when investors would have lost money in these government bonds. Uh, and what's interesting is that uh, quite often you say, well, you know, how much should I put in each? It's an incredibly important decision. Uh, but look at this. If you think of, um, you know, that looks pretty good. I don't lose money. I still make three, four percent state of inflation. I, I would ask your audience to think about this. So everyone in this call, think about this. If you take the exact same dollar over the same time period and you invest now in the safety of these treasury bills at three, four percent, what would that dollar become? So instead of 10,000, what do you think it would be? I mean, I can ask you guys, what do you think it would be? Any guesses? It's a trick question because well, I already know the answer. So you got to you got to tell Joe. All right. So I'm not gonna. This is a little drum roll there, but, don't, but what don't you see is that the same dollar from the Matrix book. You see that the same dollar over the same time period goes to a whopping twenty two dollars. Twenty two dollars. It's not missing any zeros. Uh, that's all it is. It's a huge difference between stocks and bonds. So when you're asking me about tips. Tips do a pretty good job at, at helping you with inflation, and so these 30-day treasury bills. The thing is that, that is, it, 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 when you think of an asset allocation, you have to consider the, the stock portion or the equity portion and the bond portion. And what is that mix? That is the most critical decision, in my opinion, uh, that, that an investor has to make. And the way you make the decision is by having a financial advisor who can work with you and come up with a financial plan. And when you have that financial plan, you can figure out, well, based on my circumstances, how much money I need, when do I need the money, uh, they can suggest to you a, a, an allocation between stocks and bonds. Uh, but to me, that is uh, such an important uh, uh, consideration. So tips are good, but you have to put tips in the context of how much do I want to have in, uh, in, in, in equity, in stocks, how much do I have in bonds, and, and then part of the bonds, uh, you want to maybe consider part of it going towards tips. Uh, but tips are not the only uh, 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 type of bond that protects you. These very short-term uh, bonds also historically, they've done a pretty good job over the long run uh, keeping up with inflation because as inflation changes, 30 days later, these adjust as well. So that's the reason that they, uh, uh, they do tend to do a fairly uh, a similar job in protecting from inflation. It's, it's funny, we're at the 35 minute mark, uh, which is five minutes over and we haven't even really gotten to stock. So I'm gonna end with one really big question, which is when we're thinking about setting up our portfolio, right? We're thinking about, we covered, we covered some of the things that people worry about today. We covered a couple of the questions people have, but if we're thinking about setting up that portfolio, I mean, as I'm listening 
you want in the equities, if you've got a long period of time, that's a good inflation edge, I thought, is basically what you're saying, because over long periods, uh, companies have to do that. But 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 so if I'm setting up my portfolio, what are the two to three most important things I need to think when I'm getting started? I mean, the first thing that you need to, to start is is to to know why are you investing? What are your goals? I think that it's it's the same way that 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 you can have the nicest G5 private jet and you know it's awesome and you take off uh, but but that's not the, the first thing you need to know the first thing you need to know where am i going uh, and and then to me a lot of times you know a lot of investors are, are going in and they, they like a stock they like a mutual fund they like an ETF they like uh, whatever it is um, but they don't they, they miss the the, the the first step which is let me see what my objectives are what are my financial goals what's my point a where I am right now and what's my point B and how do I get from point A to point B uh, with the least uh, uh, amount of uncertainty so to me that that's the first thing that I would say investors should do uh, the second thing that I think investors should do is uh, really pay attention to all the things that that, that are uh, frictions in investing, and and they're not trivial. Uh, probably the biggest ones are costs. Uh, you you don't want to make sure you're not chasing the small the the, the 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 cheapest investment in town because you know none of us shop for the cheapest dentist in town or go to the lot and say, you know, show me your cheapest car. You just want value. So you, you but you don't want to overpay. Uh, but there are taxes, there are considerations around that. Uh, so that's the second thing that, that I would that I would say. Say so once you establish an allocation based on a plan, second, you want to make it efficient. And third, you want to keep monitoring that 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 portfolio. So when uh, either your situation changes or the market moves, there might need to be some adjustments uh, being made, but those adjustments need to be made strategically based on uh, a process that was done in advance. One of the things that investors should not do, in my view, is just react to what happened today in the market. It's like, you know, we have a plan. Uh, when this happened, we know what we do. Uh, so I, th I think too often folks react uh, to what happened in the market and it tends to be more of an emotional decision rather than uh, what would be optimal for their portfolio. But if you establish that in advance, uh, that's that's a good. And that's what, again, one advisor can help you do. Just uh, 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 one follow up to, to wrap that up. It sounds like you're talking about having an investment policy statement, like having this list of ideas of what I'm going to do no matter what happens. We know the we know the market is going to take a dive at some point. People thought it was going to a couple of weeks ago, right? All of a sudden my yeah. Twitter feed blew up for a day and then it came right back. So yeah. uh, uh, what are some basic things or one or two basic things that you find on an investment policy statement? Well, by the way, just to make sure, <laughs> it's so funny as you're saying that that uh, it just it reminded me of the fact that I live in Los Angeles, and and um and 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 I know that the same way that the, I know the market's going to drop at some point, I know that I will have to deal with an earthquake, uh, right here in 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 uh, in, in Southern California. So uh, to me, what I want to do is be prepared for the day that comes, not try to figure out on the fly. Uh, you know, what uh, What am I going to do uh, when that comes? So that's what the investment policy statement does. It basically stipulates what am I going to do given whatever might happen. So make sure that I have, you know, the house bolted the, the foundation and I have water in the trunk and I tie the shelves to the wall. So all these things. Uh, so the, the things that I would say in the investment policy system that are uh, investment policy statement that would be important, I would say the first one is to decide, uh, based on the goal, what is the mix between uh, stocks and bonds? And then within that, kind of decide how much do I want to have in U.S. companies, international developed, and maybe emerging markets? How much do I want to have uh, in, in smaller companies, and how much do I want to have in large? So it's a very clear uh, delineation. And then along with that, to spell out, under what circumstances would I go and sell stocks? Under what circumstances would I go and sell bonds? And for example, if your policy statement can says, if, if this was a balance between stocks and bonds and stocks are taken off, like it's been an all time high, maybe the investment policy statement says that once it reach a threshold, I'm going to trim those gains, take the chips off the table, go buy maybe the bonds so I can bring the portfolio back in alignment, which is a process called rebalancing. And that's something that an investment policy statement uh, absolutely could have. I absolutely love that as a as a place to end and going to put AW's point back on the screen because Dr. Lepesky, we talked book. about 
We talk about this all the time. It says, AW says, you mean having a plan and starting with the end of mind is critical to financial success? Now you, now you know why we like him. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, I know we ran over. We won't keep you. Thank you so much, by the way, for hanging out with us for a few minutes. It's been so helpful and we really appreciate the time. It's been great fun. <laughs> Thanks a ton. And by the way, one last thing, uh, as a water polo guy, and you were a water polo coach at Michigan State, what uh, U.S. gonna gonna finish this thing off in a good way? Oh, absolutely, is gonna win. And and I know. Uh, <laughs> let me go to OG, and, and I know you have your your license plate there, but but uh, you know I do have something on my desk as well. So it is my there we go. good old Michigan State water polo hat. So I'm gonna keep it on for the remaining of the session. <laughs> Absolutely they're going to win. And if you folks don't watch water polo, the Olympics, I, you know, it's my plug. I don't, I don't sell anything else, but the idea of watch the Olympics and watch USA water polo. And, and the last thing I'll tell you is that when those men and women go and play that game, none of them are touching the bottom. So if you see somebody jumping up to their belly button, keep that in mind. They're not jumping off the bottom. Keep in mind that what happens on the water stays on the water. It's a different type of Vegas, but it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty, that's it's a what, pretty gnarly sport. That's what I was trying to tell my kids. It. We were watching a little bit of it and that's what I was trying to tell my kids. I said, you know, there's so much stuff that happens under the water that the officials don't see and oh, uh, yeah. don't, you know, don't care about. Right. But, uh, but they care, you know, but, but, uh, it's, it's pretty impressive. And, and my son who is a little bit of a swimmer was watching. He says, dad, they don't ever stop swimming. They swim the whole time. <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah. You don't stop beating up on each other. Forget about swimming. Right. <laughs> That's Dr. the Lepe easy part. Dr. Lepescu, we got some important work to do here. We got Doug's trivia waiting in the wings. So they will say goodbye. Thank you Thank for you. hanging out with us. Great pleasure. All right, Doug, you got it for me. Everybody ready? You got your thinking caps on because we've got a question for you to give away some great, uh, great swag. Let's, uh, you know, what's funny is if I knew what I was doing, and now that we're doing this on Fireside, usually for our Friday shows, I should. I yeah, should I'm not uh, starting until I get my music, Joe. I know, right? Here we go. All right. Here it is. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, world renowned physicist, expert weed whacker, and quesadilla eating champion. And if you listen to our episode today, the day of the stack, you do listen on the episode when it gets released, right? I mean, and yeah, of course you do. As you well know, we featured some Madonna-themed trivia today. Well, let's riff on that trivia for an audience question, shall we? Since you can all cheat and look up the answer, yeah, I'm looking at you, Noah from Maryland. We're going to try something a little bit different. Look at OG. I mean, look at that guy. He knows basically nothing about Madonna. You can tell that just by looking at him, except for the songs he sings during our frequent basement karaoke nights. So if you want to score some sweet SB swag, we need you to put on your hip waders and go deep into OG's mind. And guess what he answered earlier today when I asked him the following question. So I asked him, how many singles did Madonna release during her illustrious career? Of course, Everybody knows that number is 88, but that ain't what OG said, or was it? Type exactly one answer in the comments. If you type two, you're out, disqualified. We'll lock these in in just a moment. So answer quickly so we can pick the closest one. I'll be back with your answer faster than you can karaoke some ZZ Top with me. Give me all you love it. Oh, you hugs and kisses too. What a what a wow. what a what a day! By the way, to have ZZ Top uh, uh, trivia. I don't know if you saw this, but Dusty died today. Yeah. Um, died the way that I want to die. By the way, I'm nothing in my not sleep. Topical. In my in my sleep, they said passed away very peacefully. But ZZ Top man, just absolutely fantastic. As the answers come in, we're having some fun. I see Dan is in the audience. We used to do a Friday uh, chain trivia where you had to get the right answer. Uh, each week, right, to form a bigger chain. And I, I think Dan won it like 18 times. In fact, we had to disqualify Dan. So everybody giving us their one answer. So this is, and, the, this uh, is the answer that people are guessing what I guess. That you guess. the actual number. They're okay. guessing right. what you guess. Yeah. The real answer don't matter. Yeah, Everybody Absolutely. knows it's 88. All right. Everybody's uh, getting their answer, their one answer in. And uh, I'm going to count to... Five, 
backwards. Now, now, just so everybody knows, before before the final votes come in, Noah. How about Noah? Yeah, who's Madonna? Um, <laughs> before the final votes come in, I uh, grew up grew up a mere five blocks from Madonna's birthplace. Just saying. How about that? You didn't have anything to wow. do that with that, did you? Uh, Madonna's birth? No. Her, I, I, significantly I have, I have older no than idea. me. Just like you two clowns. <laughs> going, where he's going with that? All right. We. The good news is this. Meaning I know Madonna trivia, detail. so I might have been pretty close. Yeah. All right. Uh, 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 you see the you see the correct one? I have not. not I, I think I see it. <clears throat> yep. Okay. Uh, ready? Here Guys, we've given you long enough. We are locking it down. Who's right? Here we go. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and how would you like to be emotionally scarred? Of course you would. For that little adventure, you should join us at karaoke night with the SB crew. OG singing like a virgin, and then he's belting out Pop It Don't Preach. Joe thinks he's the next Steve Perry from Journey. Ha! <laughs> Tyler Perry, maybe, but no joke. If you're looking for someone who can do some dirty deeds, done dirt cheap, Joe's mom can actually belt out some ACDC. As for me, I mean, you can tell. I can rock just about any tune, but really anything Cardi B sits squarely in my wheelhouse, especially that one she does with Megan Thee Stallion. But before I go and get all braggy on you, let's get back to today's trivia. The question was, how many singles did OG guess Madonna released during her illustrious career? Madonna released a total of 88 singles and scored an incredible 71 top 40 singles. Of those, 63 hits went top 10. And what did OG guess? Well, OG was slightly over at 147, which means, Joe, I've got William C. I think it's William. As the winner. He yeah. came in late. I had a different winner. But we had... We had a tie, didn't we? We did. We had a tie for who I thought it was going to be, and then William just slid right in there. <sighs> nice job, William. Good, good, good work. Uh, congratulations, William. And I uh, had no idea then. I was way should, off. Yeah, you were swinging a big, big miss. Um, but hey, with all the Madonna you listen to, I'm surprised that you would miss by that much. Papa, don't preach. <laughs> no, nothing. Not going no, there. I'm, I'm not. This is this is on YouTube for crying out loud. <laughs> William, <laughs> William, <laughs> shoot me an email, Joe at stackybenjamins.com, so uh, I can send it to the send you some uh, code for some sweet swag. I like doing it this way because then we don't get the 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 uh, brag about uh, hey, I'm an extra small, or I'm a super huge. Like either way, whatever is your oh, brag. He's gonna he post it in the. He'll post it in the thing there. He probably he he probably will. <laughs> Uh, is, is he going to bring it? Uh, Timmy's asking tomorrow, the day that we're recording this, the hood IPO. Uh, oh, I know who this is. This is Tim. Now, uh, believe oh. it or not, I'm missing that one. I also I noticed am, that uh, Robin Hood is being invested by, investigated by FINRA. What are you talking about? Being invested? Robin Hood? No. Since when? I mean, they're trying to add it to their wall collection of the number of times they get. Number, <laughs> number four more and they get a set of steak knives investigated yeah hey we we've got uh we've got some time here for your questions for the stump og portion of the show this part brought to you by magnify money you know what happens we had doug to benjamins.com forward slash magnify money you get a free bowl of soup oh my goodness how many it's been a decade man it's been it's been a decade <laughs> that you hang out in the basement you could use it. it's not part of my job description to go to the website Back sleeping by the peaches. You go to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnified money. What happens is you find out that those brick and mortar bank products you use every day, probably not best in class. 92% of all the different banking products online listed head to head against each other at magnified money. Stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnified money sends, sends you there. I'm bragging about being a large now. There it is. Uh, right there. All right. Um, uh, so, Give us your questions. See if we can stump OG. I actually have a question here from Paul when I asked earlier today. Paul said, hey, Joe and OG, kind of an odd question, but I thought this was, this was really good. How do you deal with 
a spouse who feels so incredibly responsible for employees, she can't even mentally comprehend selling a business. Serious question. My wife's under a tremendous amount of stress running her company, about 25 employees. She could sell it tomorrow for several million dollars free and clear and live her dream of hiking, volunteering, et cetera. But when I try to broach the subject, she gets anxious about the welfare of her employees and what someone else might do to the company that she just can't even think about it. To me, a company's an asset to get us to retirement. Any advice on dealing with the subject in a way that won't make her feel like I'm being pushy. To be clear, I'm immensely proud of her. And if it wasn't for the level of stress it causes her day to day, I'd be happy for her to keep it until she dies. Thanks for that question, Paul. We're going to start with that one while we see other questions uh, come in on the feed. But OG, what do you how, think? How do, I, how do I deal with it? I love it. Sorry, I have to try to get. How do you approach that? Yeah. yeah. How do I deal with it? My wife doesn't want to sell her business. How do I deal with it? Um, I think that uh, all of us who have been entrepreneurs and started businesses have a, a a real attachment to the business and a real attachment to the people that have helped us along the way. And um, uh, I think it's why our business is so successful. Well, maybe, but um, but 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 I think it has. I think it goes beyond, you know, do you think that Steve Jobs cared about going public? No, probably because it was like, you know, he had 10,000 employees at the time, didn't care. You know, I mean, he cared, but he didn't know any of them. When you've got 25, you actually do know them all. And uh, we just had this discussion in my house. Um, uh, we were talking about, uh, this just kind of came up and uh, we talked, we were talking about compensation and that sort of stuff for our team. And, and, um, uh, and, Mrs. OG said, Hey, you know, it's okay to be the business owner. I said, Hey, we're, we're, we're doing okay. Maybe we should give a little bit around. And she said, eh, it's okay to be the business owner, to be the one, be the one that makes the money. I said, eh, let's give it around. I love this. I, I reached up and grabbed this built to sell. Oop, there it is. If I can get it built to sell. We had uh, John Warlow John, who wrote John that Warlow. book was on the show. Just an awesome book. And and, um, and I think that the way to kind of go through this is to think about it from the context of how, how should we go through and um, solve two problems. Number one is how do we extract the equity from the business in a way that is financially successful for, for, for your, you and your family, right? You've built a business, you've generated revenue, now you have this business that has equity in it. How do we capitalize that equity and turn it into money for the family? And then a separate question is, and how do I still reward my employees or make sure that they're taken care of? And those two things don't have to be done at the same time. Those two things don't have to be done in the same transaction. You know, you can think about, uh, uh, John talks about one of the things in his book is, is uh, uh, staying around as an, as an employee of your company after you've sold it. You know, there's nothing wrong with selling your company and being the CEO of that division. There's nothing wrong with uh, selling a portion of your, of your company to capture some of that equity that's built in the company and maintaining a role for, a, for the foreseeable future. We uh, talked with a business owner a couple of weeks ago who part of the actual buyout was he had to stay around for 10 more years. That was part of the deal. Like we want the business, but we want you to still run it for the next decade because we're not equipped to do it right now. We want the cash flows and we're going to pay you out up front and then we're going to pay you as an employee of that business. That's so what I was, I was thinking this is a lot about the conversation and changing your mindset because I, I kind of felt like, oh, gee, that um, one of the best things that she could do for her employees, because sometimes she's not going to be there, right? And so to have a plan, a succession plan that she chooses and to yeah. make it as smooth as possible is the best thing she can have. Denying that that's ever going to happen and saying, no, 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 no. And then she drops dead one day and there's no succession plan is the worst thing you could do for your business. So I think it's maybe just changing the discussion about um, around what's important to her, which is clearly taking care of the employees, it seems. Well, and I think that the other side of financial independence and retirement is retiring to do something, you know. I think that if, if, if your bride has, has said, Hey, the things that are really important to me are hiking and biking and spending time with family, but everything that allows you to do that is not, uh, is it, 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 something else, but you don't want to do that. Well, then the reality is, is that the things that are really more important right now is 
the process of the work that we're doing. Maybe you're doing really important work and really great work and you don't really feel like not doing that. And so that the idea of saying, well, I'm retired now. I don't have to do that work. I don't get to, don't get to do that work anymore, uh, is daunting as well. So I think, I think, uh, what you said about trying to figure out from a succession planning standpoint, but also recognizing that there's two separate transactions that you're trying to do. One is you're trying to extract the equity that you built over the years of running this business and creating this wonderful enterprise. And the second thing that you're trying to do is still stay gainfully employed and have purpose and, you know, surround yourself with the people that you like. And I think there's a way probably depending on what business it is, but my guess is there's probably a way to do both of those things. We had a discussion earlier about bonds. Leonidas review says, I'll never see the point in bonds. Why can't I just maintain two to three years in cash in my retirement years to write out the ups and downs of stocks? Uh, OG. There we got it. Yeah. I mean, if you think about the kind of ebb and flow of the stock market and, and peaks and valleys and peaks and valleys and, you know, kind of this ever increasing rise, you know, if you're graphing it or a rise to the upper right, right. It's just, I can't do that because the screen. Yeah. It goes the wrong way. Backwards. It's hard for me. To, I don't know how to make the thing. There we go. I got it that way. Like that way. Um, there's going to be periods of time when the stock market goes down just and what the real head. risk is. What's that? You just rest your head on it. Yeah. Sorry. What the, the, we have to recognize what the real risk is. The real risk isn't that the stock market goes down. That happens all the time. Stock market went down a couple of days ago. You know, it went up a whole bunch today. And it went down. It, it, you know, who knows what it's going to do. The real risk is selling stocks and the market's gone down 30 or 40%. Because what did you just do? You sold them at a loss. That's what you're trying not to do. So if you can avoid that real risk, then it allows you the the uh, flexibility to be much more aggressive in your behavior. So we like to recommend two years of cash, three years if you're super conservative, because you're not going to you're not going to be able to guess that peak. You, along the way, on the way down, you're going to say, "Whoa, those things aren't so great." Or, or you know, we're ten percent down, we're twenty percent down, we're thirty percent. Oh boy! But also, you're not going to be able to guess the bottom. So pick a point in time where, or pick a dollar amount that your portfolio is worth and say, if it goes below this, then I'm going to turn into cash. I'm just going to go cash forever until I run out of cash. That's going to give the market enough time to recover and your portfolio enough time to recover statistically uh, to get back to kind of even money, so to speak. So I like the two to three years in cash. Two, two is my number. Yeah. but the, Smash but, that but, like but, button. Hit the bell for any alerts. I know. My Ryan, kids could come in and, care of us. Could come in and do that. Ryan totally taking care of us on YouTube. We forget every time we do a YouTube event. Nice job, Ryan. He's a ninja with the YouTube, uh, with the YouTuber, as as Doug says. We, um, uh, uh, but I like your point that this is th the problem. Isn't the market? What Leonidas is talking about with the market is fine. The problem is you, and if you can't take that roller coaster ride, which inevitably, oh, gee, to your point, is going to happen. Then, um, then, then, then you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's that plus the risk of having to sell stocks at a loss. So yeah, that's, that's the big thing. Uh, I did have, I did have one more here that I wanted to get to, but, but because of the fact that it, it loops right back to our discussion of tips earlier, uh, uh, uh William says for retirees, I think you mentioned two years of cash and the rest in equities, equity, mutual funds is the two years in all cash or tips. Our tips are short-term bonds, good for one yeah. year. What do you yeah, think? With Dr. Lopescu saying that you could use tips for a year and you have it at a calendar down year, um, could you do that? Yeah, six of one, half dozen the other. I mean, the, the where you keep your two years worth of reserve is kind of sort of immaterial. You know, he was talking about if you lend money for a, for 30 days, you don't really care about inflation. The same thing, what you're doing is you're putting money in a safety deposit box, metaphorically, that break, you know, break glass in case of emergency. And if you have to make sure that that money's available in case something bad happens, um, tips are fine place, short-term government bonds, fine place, cash, fine place, CDs, fine place. It's whatever you feel most comfortable with at the moment. But, but the, uh, uh, the reality is as long as you can access it from a liquidity standpoint and make sure that it's available, uh, when you need it. And as part of your investment policy statement, especially if you're in the withdrawal phrase, let me do that again. 
withdrawal phase, I got it, uh, of your life, then I like predetermining what that number is. And here's what I mean by that. Let's say that you got a million dollars and you're taking 40,000 out of you. The, the ubiquitous 4% number. So you got 40,000 bucks a year, a million bucks. Uh, it's so confusing to have just myself on the screen right now. I don't know what to do with all that information. Um, if you wanted to have two years worth of cash, you'd have $80,000 in cash, right? So you have $80,000 in cash. You got 920 invested. And now you have to pick a number. Say my portfolio is worth a million dollars. At what number do I start drawing from the cash? And maybe that number is 800,000. If all of a sudden I wake up, my portfolio is worth 800,000 from that moment forward, I'm taking the next two years worth of money and I'm going to take it out of the, out of the cash uh, bucket of the portfolio, letting the rest of the portfolio, the other 720 do whatever it's going to do over the next two years. What we, what we've seen over, uh, uh, invest cycles is that it gives you a really high likelihood of that 720 turning back into the million in order to get back to even money over that two year period. So as long as you've got a place where you can take that money from and uh, and, and and have it be, be there and have it be liquid, that's really kind of the most important thing. Uh, thanks for the questions, guys. By the way, we've got some other great, great questions out there. Joe and, has not uh, seen 300 for, uh, who, who's the guy that asked the question? The 300? Oh, really? Absolutely, I saw 300. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Why, what then flew over my said, head? Did something just flow over my head? Indeed, it did twice. As a matter of fact, everyone else heard it. Who is I, the who, who who asked the question a little bit ago? William. Nope. About the uh, leaving the two the two months in cash. God, I love just throwing shade. Who is that? Leonidas. Yeah, I think yes. it was yeah. Leonidas. That's right. Doug? Oh, yeah. Caught it the first two times. Oh, okay, good. Then the third time. I wasn't it. sure about the pronunciation, but yeah, I mean, I got it. Is it not Leonidas? I thought it was Leonidas, yeah. I mean, oh, I Leonidas. Think. You know what's funny? Joe would have yeah, gotten it then. Okay. He said it right. All right. I'm from... I'm from I'm from West Michigan, and there's a town just south of where I grew up called Leonidas. So, uh, yes, I totally pronounced that wrong. That. Okay, come on, go, are you kidding me? Really? <laughs> that really? sounds totally made up. That's a, that's a, that's a UI if I ever heard one. Oh, there's a town. I dated a girl in fourth grade. All right, hold on. Maybe <laughs> maybe sometime in the future I might defend my honor. Maybe I might. Me. Maybe All I right. might. But for now, guys, future. we got to go. Hey, uh, got to say a big thanks again to Dr. L uh, Lepescu for hanging out with us uh, for more on, on dimensional funds. Well, Doug's going to do a lot of thanks of everybody. Um, thanks to you guys for all hanging out with us and we are going to take, I want to take some of these questions and we're going to use them, uh, during the Haven lifeline. And also during our, uh, when we do the magnify money, uh, uh, line. So thanks for those. And you may see some of these again, but for now, Doug, to finish off the show, what should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from Dr. Apollo Lepescu. Want better asset allocation? Put just a few minutes into a real asset allocation plan and you can see results that over time will beat the pants off your throw it in an index fund approach. Second, take a note from OG's pages. There's nothing wrong with capitalizing on your success as a business owner, but make sure you do that within reason to stay gainfully employed. Third, we need to stop doing these on video, Joe. Have you seen the comments saying, wow, these guys don't look anything like I thought they would? And one honest person even said, wow, Doug is way better looking than I thought he was. You might just want to take this off video for, for next time. But the big lesson, if we're trying to make OG sweat, I guess we're going to have to start posting these videos of him singing like a virgin. While his voice can peel wallpaper, at least he totally leans into whatever he's singing. I didn't know his tips could do that. Big thanks to Dr. Apollo Lupescu for joining us tonight. Want more informational information on dimensional funds? Head to dimensional.com. And also big thanks to you for hanging out with us, especially my boy Chris from India.
Indianapolis. Boiler up, baby. For a guide to future shows, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stacker, and we'll send you for free a resource-filled handbook to every Monday and Wednesday adventure. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and this has been The Stack. See ya! Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. I, I looked at the number. I think we lost three people. So not, not, not good. Just going to, just going to uh, put this on the screen here for a second. This is uh, of course my, my Bing uh, search here. Oh, for God's sakes. Yes. I get paid. Right. Okay. Is there a pronunciation you, guide for that, and, that uh, township? Hit the pronunciation button. <laughs> It is. It is Leonidas. Leonidas. It is. There was. There, there was no, somebody. There was no somebody chance. who's here with me. Who? Uh, uh, who's here with us? Uh, who said Leonidas? Somebody. Yeah, I think it was Travis. Maybe. Yeah. Yes. Travis, give us a thumb up. I'm pronouncing it right, aren't I? I got it. I got it. So. Oh, yes. He's not going to argue with you. Okay. That doesn't say the pronunciation. That has the guy. <laughs> that has the name. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, so let's, let's talk about stuff that, um, has nothing sounds to like, do. Sounds like an exciting after show. Let's talk about stuff. Let's talk about stuff. Uh, Ryan, welcome to the three old guys live stream. <laughs> Thanks Ryan. We're friends Ryan, like Ryan, Ryan said we should do a behind the scenes, uh, MTV cribs. No, <laughs> we, we don't. no, no, uh, uh, better not. I, I, I do want to get to a couple of these that I saw one, one was, uh, we'll do the serious one later. Uh, oh, gee, when you, here's a flex. We travel for work in your plane. Are the miles deductible? Not the miles, but the uh, cost of the, yeah. uh, of, of the plane. The hours. Is, uh, which is, which is substantially more <laughs> miles. So, uh, yeah. Do you get but points you, for those I'll miles? You, so, oh. Actually, there is no, there is no reward point. Well, uh, so I, uh, just finished up my taxes as CPA, sent him all the stuff and he goes, there's no possible way you spent this money on travel. And I went, well, I don't know. I, I got it written down. It's, it's in the QuickBooks, you know, and I went through it and he said, uh, what do you try it? <laughs> he goes, what are you doing? Flying private? And I'm like, well, <laughs> kind of, <laughs> maybe. Who wants to know? So, anyway. Somebody, somebody, a question for you, Doug. And I'm searching, and I can't. How long did it take Doug to become Doug? And have any other opportunities come up for voiceover work? You did get some. You did do some voiceover work, didn't you? Yeah, I've done a little bit other voiceover work. I have. Yes. Well, in fact, I have. Uh, and actually at the end of FinCon, when we did FinCon in Dallas, whenever that was like four years ago, I had a couple of people come up to me and say, uh, we may reach out to you. Never happened. It's just conference <laughs> talks, like they all the women that hit on me. But don't call us. We'll call you. Oh, yeah. They may. Yeah. That's what they said. They may call you. They may call you. That was fun. We got to... Um, yeah we got to be the MCs of FinCon. I was the MC of FinCon for three years, but the third year I said to the FinCon team, you know, this would be fun if we made it like a, like a tonight show kind of thing. 
And then we actually used our Stacking Benjamins theme music at FinCon. We, we just hijacked to, FinCon. We changed it to live from Dallas. PT, the organizer of FinCon, said, hey, bring Doug with you. I said, hey, we're going to pre-recording. So no, bring Doug. So so uh, uh, Doug came down and, and did his part live. And what was what was what was funny was I I passed Joshua Sheets because that was my third year as MC of FinCon. Passed Joshua Sheets from Radical Personal Finance Podcast in the hallway, and he leans into me and goes, "I'm just amazed how every year you're able to turn FinCon more into the Stacking Benjamin Show." <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe slightly, but remember that year we had D one who's been on the show before D one jumped on my desk. I had that desk, like, you know, Jimmy Fallon has or everybody else. And D one is rapping and he jumps on the desk and that desk looked like it was going to look going to break. I was sure the desk was done. Yeah. The worst part for me was, uh, when I really understood the reach of my fame, I'm, I'm in the bathroom and I've got a neighbor, Doug name tag. I on. Want to hear about the Robert Kiyosaki like taps me on the shoulder while I'm at a urinal and he wants a photo. <laughs> Come on, man. He's Guy like, Kiyosaki, nice back off, pal. Back off, man. Uh, uh, qu question, some joke. questions about the, some questions about the tour. We had a question from Chris, uh, specifically about when this was out on the feed, uh, which it will, um, the Nashville will be over, but this is specifically about Nashville. How many stackers are RSVP for the Nashville? Yep. We're at, I think, 25 people so far. Um, and uh, we have what, a week again, to go. Way? When do I have to be there? Uh, it starts at seven o'clock. Yeah, cool. What day, bro? <laughs> That's <laughs> what day? A Tuesday. That's the type of planning we do here in the basement. What day? Is it uh, Tuesday? <laughs> It's Tuesday night. Yeah. Tuesday. Got it. Tuesday, Tuesday, night, Tuesday, 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 seven, seven to nine. But right now we got about 25. So we'll probably end up in the 40, 45 range. Where, I would think. Where is it? It's at the Bavarian beer house. That's right. You did which, tell me that. Which is right by the new Grand Ole Opry. Apparently there's an I'm old Grand Ole Opry and a new Doing Grand Ole fro. Opry. Mostly yes. fro. And it's, and it's right there. So, um, yeah. So the, uh, and he said, uh, you know, I'd like to come and hang out, but I'm a little timid with the virus stuff. Uh, we're going to be outside. We will be outside. Now the bad news about being outside is that, uh, it could be hot in Nashville at seven o'clock at night this time of year. It could also be raining. Um, we do have covered seating, um, in, uh, over some of the tables. So hopefully that happens. If not, the beer hall inside is huge with a big, with a big roof, but, um, and but we, Joe we, and OG have been fully vaccinated. Hopefully going to be outside. Yes. So, uh, that is that for the tour. Um, because there's a question here, are we coming to Boston? The answer is yes, we're coming to Boston. Um, I, I Boston, can't announce this, um, exactly yet what we're doing but we're 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 on final approach so we have we have a sponsor for the tour which is what we were waiting for uh, we have a sponsor but the sponsor may want to change a few things so i can't say what day we're coming but it appears that all 40 cities are intact that i had suggested that we'll do eight live shows starting with cincinnati i do know the date of, in cincinnati it's uh oh gee do you got that one that's like november 17th i think um, 13th. but, but uh, the 13th, November 13th, that? It, what's that? I said, is Doug invited to the Cincinnati one? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh awesome. Doug will be there. Love me some skyline. <laughs> so the third, <laughs> the third, the third, uh, uh, leg of that. The fourth leg is the Northeast. So I would guess we're headed to Boston sometime, um, in, uh, in early February of next year. What could well, go wrong in Boston early February? Is, yeah. <laughs> Perfect time to be there. There's, there's, uh, no better time to be in the Northeast of the United States than February 19th. But, yes. um, Basically, the tour stuff, assuming that everything's open and et cetera, et cetera, is, is you're planning the first quarter. Lots of travel in the first quarter, right? So yeah. uh, so that kind of narrows it down for everybody. And, and then uh, some of those will hit together, you know? Yeah. Depending on... Uh... 
Oh, G said he's going to as many as he can. Chase, Chase asked about Phoenix. Phoenix is definitely on that Pahonix. list. Phoenix. I'm going to be at Phoenix as, uh, as, the day before the well. Cincinnati thing, which is going to make it really challenging to get to Cincinnati. William is reminding me that uh, my my that, that Charleston, or, uh, South Carolina is home of the Citadel, where I went to college. He thinks oh, that I'd God had sake. so many of these that I can't remember. <laughs> oh, couldn't, that, couldn't have that, an episode without mentioning the Citadel, could we? Is that where I was? Yeah. He mentioned it. I did not mention it. Sure, Look, we'll put sure, we'll put sure. his thing up up here. I think, yes. I think he's so, a plant. Anyway. All right, uh, guys, we'd love to stay and hang out, but I've got dinner waiting for me. So everyone, thanks for hanging out. Really a, fun time. What were you saying, Doug? Oh, he's a dinner bragger. Somebody's made it for him and it's waiting. I got to go throw my TV dinner in the microwave. Enjoy that. <laughs> I got to go. I have. Yeah, we can end it on Sean's. I will not be going to Leonidas. <laughs> uh, I will have a stop in Kalamazoo where I grew up at my high school um, uh, and uh, on my way to Chicago. So we will be in Chicago as well. So good stuff. All right, guys. Chicago. 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 Yeah. And Fahonix, right? You guys see that commercial? Fahonix. Yeah. All right, guys. 